Please join me in welcoming KT McFarland. It's really great to be here in the coven. Because <laughs> uh, sometimes that's what it feels like, I think, as a conservative woman. Um, I just, I think what I'd like to do, if it works for you, is I'll talk about sort of flashpoints in the world. And then I'd really like to talk about why it's so important for you to do what you're doing and what you're going to be doing. When I started out in the national security world at age 18, working for Richard Nixon, um, and when I went to graduate school, when I worked at the Pentagon, I would frequently be the only woman in the room, and I would always get the question, what's a nice girl like you doing, dealing with nuclear weapons, or China or the Soviet Union, or stuff that really isn't a woman's business? Um, that's why it's really terrific to be here at the Claire Booth Luce Foundation, because that's what Claire Booth Luce did. She did stuff that wasn't supposed to be what a nice girl did. Um, and she helped change the world. And that's what you're going to do. Now, one of the things I think is so important for what I do, which is national security foreign policy stuff, is people, particularly the mainstream media, the sort of national ethic, liberals would say, well, you know, that's not women's stuff, right? Who cares about foreign policy? You're supposed to care about education, and you're supposed to care about health care. Well, no, you're really actually supposed to care about foreign policy, and I'm going to tell you why. One, it's all about the economy and jobs. For the last 10 years, we fought wars in the Middle East over oil. And what does that have to do with the American economy? Number two, if you don't fix this, if you don't fix this, your generation is going to pass on to your children's generation a very different America and a very different place in the world for your children and grandchildren. And finally, you know, when we fight wars, especially wars that we don't win, it's our kids who fight them, our sons and now our daughters. I'm proud to say I'm a Navy mom. My daughter is in the United States Navy. So you need to care about these things. Now, I'd like to say that the final reason you should care about it is because the boys aren't doing such a great job. <laughs> and it doesn't matter, Republican, Democrat, liberal, conservative. You know, the United States, I think, is commonly thought of by, by ourselves as a country that's on the decline. Um, if we start thinking that way about ourselves and believing it, the rest of the world starts believing it, too. And that's not the world we inherited, and I don't think it's the world we should pass on. So I want to tell you about the good news and the bad news in foreign policy. And I think if you ask any woman, she'll say, give me the bad news first. <laughs> I will. <laughs> the bad news is the wheels are about to come off the bus. Uh, Hillary Clinton is getting out of Washington just in time. And she is going to have four years of sh saying, I had a great record, and then watching as the world kind of collapses around us. There are, f there are five things to really watch for in areas of the world. And I don't want to get into the Middle East in too great a detail, because I know you're going to hear about that this afternoon. But if you look at the Middle East and the Arab Spring, it's not gone as, as advertised. It, in fact, is an area of the world that has gone in two short years from being largely stable, pro-American, with economic and political order to it, to a world that from the Atlantic Ocean through North Africa to the Middle East to the Persian Gulf all the way over to Afghanistan is going to be a world that's in political and economic chaos and increasingly anti-American. Egypt, the country that two years ago the Obama administration was very happy to just toss away the pro-American dictator. Dictator, but at least he was pro-American. What's happened in Egypt is it is now a country on the brink of economic collapse. They don't have enough money to feed their people. They're the world's largest importer of wheat. They are increasingly anti-American, pro-Islamic. They have a Muslim Brotherhood government. And what they are threatening to do, I think, is threaten the peace of the entire region because they're threatening to renegotiate, their, or not negotiate, they're threatening to walk away from the peace agreement they have with Israel. Now, why does e Egypt matter to us? I mean, unless you want to go to the pyramids, right? Who cares? It does matter, because as Egypt goes, I think the rest of that region goes. It's the largest, most populous, historic, the country that the other countries in the Middle East look to. It also sits astride the Suez Canal. Now, if any of you heard about the Strait of Hormuz near Iran, right, we're worried about if there's a conflict with Iran that the Iranians would close the world's oil supplies by closing the Strait of Hormuz. Well, look at the map and you'll see that Egypt is on the 
Suez Canal. That's where a majority of the world's trade goes from Europe to Asia. If something happens there, that will also have a phenomenal and immediate impact on the world economy. So watch Egypt. And again, I think that those wheels are coming off that bus. I think that it's a country that can't feed itself, that increasingly is going to be an economic chaos. I wouldn't be surprised at all if you have another Egyptian revolution within the next 18 months. Syria. Again, a country that unless you're sort of planning to go to the Middle East, who cares about Syria, right? You should care. Because Syria has chemical weapons, and when Syria, the war that's going on and has been going on in, in Syria for over a year, that war will eventually mean that the government of Syria collapses, and Syria is one of the world's largest collectors of, of chemical and biological weapons. When those weapons are loosed upon the region, they could be coming eventually to a shopping center near you. Now, that sounds hysterical, but it's not. Remember two years ago when Gaddafi of Libya was, was overthrown and everyone was worried, well, what happens to Gaddafi when he was sort of kicked out of town and he was hiding in parts of Libya? I didn't really care where Gaddafi was. I figured he'd eventually show up. I cared about his weapons, and nobody managed to secure those weapons when Gaddafi fell. That's why you had Benghazi. Those weapons, the stockpiles that belonged to Muammar Gaddafi were never secured. It was somehow nobody thought of it. And when we helped topple that dictator, what happened was those weapons then went into the hands of very bad guys. Benghazi was a, is a place where the groups have, uh, are armed with a lot of those weapons. If you saw it uh, three weeks ago, there was a hostage standoff in Algeria at a gas, um, a gas um, facility, natural gas facility. Those weapons were weapons that were Gaddafi's weapons. In North Mali, a country which actually is not near Bali in the South Pacific, it is in fact in Africa, that country has got an Al-Qaeda footprint and those, are being, those weapons were coming from Libya, the weapons we failed to secure. Are we going to fail to do the same thing with Syria and secure the, nuclear, the chemical weapons? I'm very concerned that that's what will happen. We will not get there in time, and those chemical weapons will find their way into the hands of some very bad actors who won't necessarily keep them in the Middle East. The next reason the wheels are coming off the bus is Iran. Iran is a country that historically we've been friends with and we've not been friends, but for the last, since the late 1970s, we have not been friends with, and it's the country I think which is the greatest threat to world peace today. They want nuclear weapons. Um, the administration has, I think, been very ineffective in trying to stop them. I think the Bush administration was ineffective. I think what you're seeing is that within, by the end of this administration, by the end of Obama's term, Iran will be a nuclear weapons state. And what that will do will mean several things. One, Iran will then try to be the dominant power in the Persian Gulf. And it, because it will be a nuclear weapons state, it'll kind of get away with it. And Iran will then become the dominant power in the entire Persian, um, the Arabian Peninsula. Now, why does that matter to us? Because that's where 40% of the world's exported oil comes from. And if Iran has its hands on control of that, it in effect can control a large part of the world's economy because this is a world that really does run on oil. The other reason it's important, though, to notice what will happen with Iran and a nuclear weapon, if it becomes a nuclear weapon state, which I think it will, is that it will encourage all the other countries in that part of the world to get nuclear weapons of their own. And they'll have the money to do it. Saudi Arabia is a really rich country. Saudi Arabia has already said they're going to get nuclear weapons if Iran does. The United Arab Emirates will probably get them. Egypt, which can't feed its people, will probably find a way to get them. Turkey will certainly want them. And so you'll see the single most destabilized, um, chaotic part of the world world awash in nuclear weapons. What does that mean? It means that the horror that everybody's had since Hiroshima and Nagasaki, that other country, there would be another nuclear weapons, um, it, that we would have a nuclear war, that nuclear weapons would go off. I think that, that the likelihood of that really goes up exponentially. If a part of the world where governments seem to change on the flash of a hat could have nuclear weapons and the likelihood of one being used by accident, intentionally, getting in the hands of the bad guys, goes up. That's the world you're going to see within four years. Finally, China, to go around the world to the other flashpoint, which is the other part of the world, is China and North Korea. China, because it's economically strong and powerful, it perceives the United States as on the decline economically, politically, morally. They have started to become far more aggressive in their foreign policy. They've got a map now 
where they show that there's an area called the South China Sea, surrounded by Vietnam, it's surrounded by um, Indonesia and the Philippines. They've claimed that not as the South China Sea, which is in effect the Western Pacific, they say that's an internal Chinese lake. And what that means is that they have every intention of really becoming the dominant power, deciding who sails around those seas. And I think that you'll see increasingly China will, will take step by step by step to become the dominant power in the, in the Western Pacific, if not the entire Pacific. Now, again, why do we care? We've got a lot of friends in that part of the world, Japan, Philippines, countries that we have alliances with, but it's also an area where a lot of the world's seagoing trade goes. In fact, there's something called the Strait of Malacca in the South China Sea, which has even more shipping than the Strait of Hormuz. Um, so it's a part of the world that we want to keep free and, and open for world trade and commerce and relationships and a part of the world that China doesn't necessarily want to have that happen. And then finally, there's North Korea. And we laugh at this guy, right? That Kim Jong-un, who's Kim the Third, his grandfather founded the state. Just last week, they released a video. Um, it was a rock video, We Are the World. And they showed a picture of New York City, um, what New York City would look like if a mushroom cloud went over it. Now, North Korea, again, this is a country that can't feed its people. We kind of laugh at it. It's a joke. It's not a joke because it has nuclear, we it has, in effect, nuclear weapons, and it is building missiles that are, have the capability right now of reaching where we sit from North Korea to the west coast of the United States. And within probably four or five years, we'll have the ability to send a nuclear weapon on a missile and reach anywhere in the United States. I don't think North Korea is going to wake up and nuke Santa Barbara. I really don't, but I do think what they'll do is sell those nuclear missiles and weapons to Iran. So that's all the bad news, and it's, it just sounds like a horrible world, and it will be a very bad world for the next four years, and it is starting now. That's all the bad news, but there's a lot of good news, <laughs> believe it or not, <laughs> and here's the good news. Five years from now, starting really now, but increasingly, we will find that the United States is the world's superpower in terms of energy. If you look at the last hundred years, why do countries go to war? We have fought world wars, regional wars over energy. World War I was in part a fight where the Germans wanted to get hold of the coal field. Coal was the energy of the day in Central Europe. World War II, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor because they wanted oil that the United States was denying them. And so they thought if they attacked the United States at Pearl Harbor, they would then have the oil they needed. The last 10, 15 years of wars in the Middle East have in large part been about oil. We need the oil that comes out of the Middle East. The world needs the oil that comes out of the Middle China needs the oil that comes out of the Middle East. Well, what has happened in the last two years in the United States is American engineers have developed two technologies. One, they've developed the technology to look deep underground and under oceans. And when they have developed that technology, they have started looking. They've looked under the water. They've looked under the land. And what they've found is, oh, my God. We have abundance of natural gas and oil. In fact, we have so much of the stuff that we are the Saudi Arabia of the next decade. We have more oil than Saudi Arabia. We have more natural gas than Russia. We, are the, we have now been handed a life preserver by, by nature. And we now have the ability, because the second ability that we've developed is we know how to get that stuff out. We know with fracking, it's got to be safe fracking, but we know how to extract natural gas and oil from areas of the United States. North Dakota, where I'm sure the Lieutenant Governor of Wisconsin has these debates all the time. You look over at North Dakota, North Dakota is not some sleepy state. North Dakota is now the Texas of the next decade. Why? Because they've, ex they've used this fracking technology to take advantage of the natural gas and oil that they find underneath their feet. What will happen? is the whole world mindset is going to change in about five years. The United States, in two years' time, way ahead of schedule, we are now a net exporter of natural gas. And people say that, well, if we develop all this new technology, maybe by 2020 we could be a net exporter of oil. I think it's going to come much faster than that. And what that means then is the United States no longer is dependent on the Middle East. We no longer have to worry about them killing each other. We have the in, in energy within the United States that's abundant. 
it's secure, in other words, we can get to it, and it's cheap. And what that will do will revitalize the American economy in a way that nothing has, hap nothing has been able to do really since the Industrial Revolution. It's going to be bigger than the internet. It's going to change America's position in the world and our position within ourselves. You know, when I know that any of, per certainly any of you at the state level and anybody from Washington, and the, especially the people worried about the fiscal problem, we've got $16 trillion of debt. We're not going to pay that back. I don't care what anybody tells you. There's no way we pay that back. And most states, you can see the dysfunction in Washington. We can't seem to figure out how to balance our checkbook, right? We spend more than we take in. And I don't care how much you think you're going to raise taxes. You're never going to bridge that gap. What this energy allows the United States to do, and the United States uniquely to do in the world, is to wipe that debt off the, off the page. And you could then see the United States, which is economically solvent, which is secure in its energy sources, and the whole world looks to us once again. So that's the good news. The bad news is bad. Got to live through that. But the good news is coming. Now, why is this important to you? Because I can tell you that national security, the number one issue of national security is a sol solvent and strong economy. We don't get that part right. Everything else is collateral damage. Every, there won't be any money for submarines or tanks or an intelligence service or satellites unless we solve the economic problem. And we have now been given that life preserver. And that's why it's so important to take that life preserver and to develop our domestic energy sources. Um, I want to take my national security expert hat off. And I want to put on my Reagan administration hat and tell you, especially the young people here, you guys have a unique opportunity that will never come knocking at your door again. The world is a very different place today, right? You all feel hostility on your college campuses. You know, you're kind of ashamed to admit that you're a conservative if you ever meet some cute guy. The world is, <laughs> you're really kind of a, a minority and you're supposed to feel ashamed about being that minority. Well, within you is the ability to change the country. The wheels are coming off this bus. In foreign policy, four years from now, people are going to be looking around and saying, oh my god, what did we do wrong? The, the physical problems in Washington, they're not going to be easily solved. We're going to have unemployment. I mean, the statistic now is for under 30-year-olds, the millennials, unemployment, the employment is only 60%. And of the 60% who have jobs, only th half of those are real jobs, I mean full-time jobs. So just think, only three people out of 10 have full-time paying jobs. Well, that's going to show the world. I mean, we're, we're all going to see it, whether the liberal media wants you to believe it or not. The system isn't working. And so it falls upon the young people here who have the energy, who have the vision, who have the optimism, who don't yet have the mortgage, <laughs> to then go out and change the world. And that's the group that Michelle and I were part of. When we... Entered, when we were conservatives fighting you know, for President Reagan to be reelected, if people had told Michelle and me in the 70s, I mean, I worked in the White House in the middle 70s. I used to walk across the anti-war demonstrations to get to my office. We were really a minority, and people thought we were crazy, we were foolish, we were square, we were nerds, we were whatever. But ultimately, when President Reagan who was the leader of that movement, tried time and time again. He didn't win the presidency the first time he ran. He didn't win the presidency the second time he ran. He won the third time he ran, and he changed the world. So the glimmer and the acorn of hope <laughs> um, that people had in the, in the 70s, knowing that at the, by the end of the 70s, it wasn't working. The wheels were coming off the bus just like they are today. The economy didn't work. There was stagflation. The United States was going to be surpassed by the Soviet Union. And yet there was a core group of people who believed and stuck to it. And that was a group of people who then changed the world. That group of people, those young people, and they were all young, because only the young people have the energy and the optimism and the enthusiasm and the no mortgage to go out and change and take those chances and change the world. And we did. When President Reagan came into office, when I went into the Pentagon, we looked around, we were horrified by what we found. There had been almost a decade of underinvestment in defense after the Vietnam War. We had airplanes that couldn't fly because there weren't enough pilots who were certified who had had enough training hours. We had ships that couldn't sail because they didn't have fuel. And for every tank we had that worked, we had one sitting right next to it that would cannibalize for spare parts. That's what we had done with America's defenses. But what was even worse 
was what we had done to our men and women in the military. We had not given our Vietnam vets adequate mental and physical health benefits or retirement benefits, and so we found homeless vet after homeless vet. That's the world that we saw and we changed. And we changed it to go from a period where you go and have tanks that don't work and homeless vets in wheelchairs to a world within a decade of the United States won the Cold War without firing a shot. That was because young American men and women believed in it and went to work for it. We had a country that was stagflation. When I graduated from college, the, if you wanted to buy an apartment, you know what the, the interest rate was? It was like almost 20%. I mean, for poor people, you know, if it was your first thing, but it was certainly 15%. The economy was dead. It was on life support. Nobody thought it would ever come back. And yet, what did we have by the 1980s, by the mid-1980s? An economic boom that has changed the world, changed the United States. So all those things are present today. It is history repeating itself. Foreign affairs, the United States is going to be questioned for the next several years. We're probably going to cut back on our defense. I hope to God that we don't, but my guess is we'll cut back on our veterans' benefits. The economy isn't going to work. All those, the millennials don't have jobs, they're not going to get jobs. If the economy recovers, it'll be a jobless recovery. Well, you know, what does that mean if you want a job, right? And so by the end of this period, the United States is going to have a boom it's going to be the normal course of the pendulum swinging, but it's only going to swing in the right way if people like you get out and do it. And you've, this moment will not come again. Michelle and I know, you, if you don't seize this, if you don't get out and work, if you don't be the one lone Republican conservative who goes out door to door and convinces your friends and tells you why they believe in, why you believe in what you do and why they should too, you are going to end up being an old lady. <laughs> sitting home by the campfire saying, oh, we really missed our shot. Or you have a choice. You can give up an awful lot now, and you can go out, and you can change this country back to where it belongs, forward to where it belongs, and you can change the world. So do it, okay? <laughs> Now, I'm happy if, if we have time. Do you want to do some questions? You can ask me anything about, you know, how I found a cute guy sitting right over there, five children, North Korea's nuclear weapons, anything. Yeah. Um, just recently, uh, Obama sent uh, some F-15 fighter jets to Morsi of Egypt and some Abrams tanks. Why would he do that? Send it to someone who has absolutely declared that they, he disdains America and, of course, thinks Israel, they're all apes and pigs. So why has he done that? <laughs> well, I, I'm not going to sit here and tell you how President Obama thinks. But uh, <laughs> the, the, the question is that the United States is giving, because it's not giving, it's selling. We're, we say we're selling, but we're lending them the money to buy from us um, advanced, sophisticated weapons, airplanes, and tanks. Um, the argument that they give is that, well, this was part of a deal, multi-year deal. We'd signed it with the previous Egyptian government, so we're just making good on the deal. The other argument they give is to say, well, you know, they're going to get mad at us if we don't give them this stuff. Uh, they might do terrible things to us. And that, to me, is the tail wagging the dog. I mean, I'm all for foreign aid. I think it's really great. To, I think it's much better, cheaper to buy friends than kill enemies. But I want something for it. And if by transferring these weapons to Egypt, while Egypt at the one hand is saying, give me the stuff, and at the other hand is saying, I'm going to potentially break that peace agreement that we've had with Israel for the last 40 years, the peace agreement which has kept the peace in the Middle East for the longest time, probably since the fall of the pharaohs, um, a peace agreement which was negotiated by my boss, Henry Kissinger, in 1973, 74, 75, if it, Egypt is going to do that, I don't think we should give them a darn thing. And I think what we should do is use our economic power, particularly our economic power because they don't eat if we don't give them the money, um, to say, we want to have a friend here. We want something for that money. And the other question I think I would ask before I would give anything to Egypt right now is, what do you intend to do with that stuff? Who's your enemy? Is this stuff you want to use like for a war against Israel? Is this something you want to use against your own people and another revolution that might come? And so, no, I think that, I don't know why the Obama administration is doing it. I think they, they had a very woolly-headed policy towards the entire Middle East, which they thought, oh, we'll overthrow dictators. And then they walked away. And what I have seen in my lifetime of studying war and peace is that a revolution is always a three-act play.
Act one, everybody agrees, let's overthrow the dictator. Whether it's the Russian Revolution, the Chinese Revolution, you know, the French Revolution, the American Revolution. But then there's act two. And act two is when all the guys who overthrew the dictator are now starting to, they realize it's their turn. And they don't, they don't know how to govern. They fight with themselves. All the things that had united them originally in act one all come out, that's gone. So they then, they then try to get their act together. Often they don't. And then there's act three. And by Act 3, either the good forces of self-governance, the good, well-meaning rebels get it together, like they did in the American Revolution, and they have a strong self-governing system, or they don't get it together. And then what happens is an even worse dictator usually shows up. That's what happened in Iran in the Iranian Revolution. That's what happened in the Russian Revolution. I think the problem with the administration's policies towards the Middle East is they left the theater at the end of Act 1. They toppled those dictators as fast as they could and then walked away and didn't help the people, the rebel forces, the new governments to form security forces. That's what we did in Libya. They toppled that guy and then they walked away. They didn't help them set it up. In Egypt, they did the same thing. Toppled a dictator and then walked out the, of the theater. So act two is what you're seeing now. They're all fighting amongst themselves. They can't get their act together. And although the Islamist Radical forces, Al-Qaeda, and I know you're going to hear a lot more about that this afternoon, but those forces, which did not start the Arab Spring, they are then taking advantage of it. They're showing up in Act 2, and they're going to try to run Act 3. So why Obama's doing it, I, I, actually, I have no idea why they're doing it, but it's the wrong thing to do. <laughs> okay, anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Wake Forest in the back, right? <laughs> Um, my question is for you. You talked about how you were the minority working or being a woman in government, but you know when you're in government, especially in foreign policy, you kind of have to be outspoken and assertive. And how have you found that balance? Because I know when a woman's a strong woman, they're kind of come across as aggressive, and people attack them. And I think we've seen that a lot. But how have you found that balance of being able to be outspoken and share what you think, but not get attacked or? Yeah, you know, and it's a really hard balance to strike because as a woman, you know, I mean, I'm part of that generation of women who were the, although I didn't agree with Gloria Steinem, I certainly believe women had the right to an equal education and equal professional opportunities. Um, do you then sort of deny the fact that you're a woman? I also wanted to have a family and a husband and, and you know, as well as a career. Um, I think that one of the, the guiding lines that I would say for any young woman is understand that it should be equal, but it probably isn't in a lot of ways. So the way you yourself can deal with it, just be smarter and better and work harder. I mean, I tell this to my two daughters. You know, just be better. I was better educated, smarter, worked harder than most of my male contemporaries. Um, I also got academic credentials that they couldn't argue with. I mean, I studied nuclear weapons at MIT. You know, nobody was going to mess with me. Uh, <laughs> But I also think that it's important to just be true to yourself and what you believe in and know that you want a full life. You don't just want a career. You don't just want parts of that full life. And, you know, I have daughters your age. And what I've told them is that this is the really, this is the greatest time in the history of the world to be a woman. You know, our grandmother's generation, if they had a, they had to choose family or career, or career, and what was career? Maybe you could be a teacher, maybe you could be a nurse, but you had to give those up when you worked. When I was in the Pentagon in the early 1980s, there were, I, I had men, I had the civilian equivalent rank of a three-star general, and I had men who were working for me who were colonels. They had never worked with a woman before, other than a secretary or a nurse. They sure had never worked for a woman. But I, I think that you, every woman needs to find her own way. What's your best leadership style? What's your best way of connecting with colleagues? Remain true to yourself, but just work harder, be better. At the end of the day, it's terrific. And the advice I would give any woman, as I, give, as I said, I give my daughters, is it is a great time to be a woman. You can have all that. You can have a career. You can have a family. For me, I couldn't have them all at the same time. I took a decade, 15 years off to be a stay-at-home mom. But understand that you will always be frustrated. You're always, if you're married with kids and you're trying to keep a career, you're going to think, oh, I'm not doing either one very well. If you choose to be married and, and give up your career or don't have a career, you're going to think, oh, gosh, what am I missing? If you choose not to have a family 
and you really throw yourself into your career, you think, oh, I'm not fulfilled. Just understand the fact that you're going to probably spend 10 or 15 years being really frustrated. <laughs> but it's OK. You're going to feel guilty. You're going to feel guilty. I'm not doing it. But at the end, it's just so much better because you have the opportunities that your mother's generation, your grandmother's generation never had, and take full advantage of them. Every woman finds her own way through this. But know that you're not alone. And it's just a terrific time to be a woman. Katie, I have a question for you. Yeah. Um, a lot of American women are uninformed on national security issues. If there is one issue that you could um, just really hammer into the minds of American women, what would it be? And how would you message that to women? That's a great question. You know, why are American women uninformed? I think this for a couple of reasons. It's because nobody talks to them in English. Uh, you know, foreign policy, national security, they, there's this whole like priestly language, you know, MIRVs, ICBMs, throwaways, and it's stuff that you can't sort of common sense your way through. And I think that's the, that's the fault of a lot of our political leaders, is they don't translate it into English that anybody can understand. If there's one important, the most important national security issue today, I think, is the economy. We don't get that right. As I said, nothing else matters. In a, Put that aside, though, and let's assume that my scenario is right, that we do, it does work out because of the energy abundance we found. The one thing you don't recover from is nuclear exchanges. When I was at MIT and studied and taught nuclear weapons in the, in the late 70s, early 80s, late 70s, oh god, even middle 70s, uh, <laughs> one of the things that we worried about was that the whole world was going to get nuclear weapons. Um, we worried that there was going to be a massive proliferation of weapons. There were, at the time, five countries that had nuclear weapons. And we assumed that, she within five or 10 years, you know, 10, 15, 20 countries. That never turned out to be true. There were a couple more countries, India, Pakistan, now probably North Korea, who got nuclear weapons. But it didn't turn out the way everybody thought. So there was like a big sigh of relief. All you had to deal with was the Soviet Union, China, secure, mature, stable countries, none of which wanted to commit suicide. Um, but I think that the, the biggest issue now is the fact that there will be a lot more nuclear weapons around, and they will no longer be necessarily in the hands of countries. Um, we are going to see a breakdown of sovereignty, of the notion of statehood and nationhood that we haven't seen in 500 years. There is no longer, you don't really worry about China nuking us, but you worry about some jihadi in the desert of Yemen getting his hands on nuclear weapons. And so I would really th say it's, it's, that, it's the proliferation of nuclear weapons, and it's in the hands of very irresponsible actors who are certainly going to be happy to make it their suicide mission. That's actually such a terrible thought, isn't it? <laughs> so that's why it's so important for you guys to get out there and do things. I have a question for you. If yeah, I may. Michelle. Um, most of us who've had, you know, some measure of success in our lives, we look back and there's a person or a couple of people that really made a difference, that encouraged us. Would you share if there's such a person or persons in your life? Oh, this is going to sound so corny. <laughs> I think my husband. Um, When I married Alan in 1985, I'd had, you know, like you, this superstar career. I mean, I was the highest ranking woman at the Pentagon. You know, generals and admirals would salute me. Um, and yet I found someone that I adored. I got married. I gave up my career. Uh, it was a time when we had won the Cold War. So for me, you know, Cold Warrior, I sort of was out of business. Um, <laughs> And so I became a stay-at-home mom for five kids, and that's the hardest thing I've ever done. And my husband sort of had married this superstar in Washington, you know, cover of Washingtonian magazine, and all of a sudden, within a year, he's married to a stay-at-home mom who's, you know, I mean, doesn't even put the eyeliner on every day. <laughs> and, and yet he just was so supportive. And then after September 11th, when, um, and then I guess the other person who really inspired me to get back to work was my then ninth grade daughter, who said, I mean, we live in New York, September 11th happened, I was downtown, saw the second, you know, the second tower get hit and come down. We had a lot of friends who died. We had 
um, what was particularly hard was um, one of my husband's best friend's daughter died in the World Trade Center bombing. And so my daughter at the time said to me, Mom, are you just going to keep like going to lunch with your girlfriends? <laughs> Are you going to get back to work? <laughs> and I realized that because of just the coincidence of history in my life, I had worked for Henry Kissinger. He had been a mentor. I'd written in the Nixon administration, the opening to China, the Middle East peace negotiations, the first arms control agreements with the Soviet Union. I had had luck in being very well educated. And then I worked for Reagan when we won the Cold War. And so I thought, yeah, I'm not going to just keep going to lunch with my girlfriends. And so I got back to work. And I got and re-entered public life. Um, and again, my husband, who had seen superstar, housewife, then superstar, you know, not superstar, but working girl again, was really supportive of that change. And particularly what motivated me, I mean, he encouraged me, but what motivated me were my daughters. And that daughter who said, Mom, are you going to get back in the fight? And that, that daughter then ended up going to the Naval Academy and is a lieutenant in the United States Navy. So she was my inspiration. And he was my strong spine and support. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, no, no doubt the world is a safer place when we have a strong military. Yeah. And, that, and that's, that's important to keep in mind. But yet there's a, sort of a symbiotic relationship between the economy and the military. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, c c how much we can afford of, of each. And, you know, what... What, what do you see happening to, to keep up a strong military or do you see that eroding? And maybe some of these young people would recognize that that's a, that's a great place for women. Yeah, in national security and certainly serving in, in the armed forces. Um, yeah, you know, what we tend to do after every war, and particularly if it's an unsuccessful war, is we flack away at national defense. We take its peace dividend whether we should or shouldn't. We did after World War II, we did after World War I, we did after Vietnam, and we're going to do that again. Um, we are definitely going to cut defense. Should we? Could we? You bet. Um, but I don't think we should do it with a, unthinkingly or with a meat axe. I, I can tell you right now there are plenty of places to cut. But I wouldn't do it to the extent and the way that the administration is probably going to end up doing it with these sequestration. I don't know if you've heard that. Does, that. does anybody know what that means? Does that sound familiar? Sort of, sort of. OK, well, there are these big cuts planned. Um, and for the most part, the administration, I think, wants to cut defense um, and not necessarily use that savings to then balance the budget or to reduce taxes. They're going to take the money out of defense, and they're going to put it in social programs. Um, where would I cut defense without harming national security? I think there, there are places, I mean, I would certainly, um, I would certainly eliminate a lot of the civilian work staff that we've, we increased after September 11th. We've, I mean, my old office, I went back to my old office at the Pentagon a couple of weeks ago, and where I would sit, there are now little partitions and there are 20 people there. Well, they don't need 20 people. I mean, what are those 20 people doing? They're all going to each other's meetings. <laughs> They're not busy doing stuff. Um, I would also, you, you can probably just cut a lot out of the, um, maybe not the Marines, but the Army, because we are not going to fight another big land war. But where I would then take that savings is not put it into social programs. I'd put it into other parts of the military and defense. I think cyber is just the biggest issue we're going to face. Now, you know, nuclear you don't recover from. Cyber, it's going to make life really difficult. But we have no defense again for cyber cyber attacks, cyber hacking. I mean, even this morning, I saw on the news that George H.W. Bush's emails were hacked into. It's a former president of the United States with Secret Service protection, and his emails are getting hacked. You know, the, the world of, of, of hacking and cyber computing, there's, there's several things that are happening. One, criminal elements are hacking into banking systems, primarily banking systems, and stealing credit card information. And they're going to—that's how they're, they make their business. A lot of those criminal elements are coming out of the former Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. The second kind of uh, cyber attacks are happening, and these are coming largely from China, is that they're hacking into civilian infrastructure and to defense industries. So we, for example, may, let's say we're developing a new fighter, um, stealth fighter. We spend years tens of billions of dollars to develop state-of-the-art weapon systems. And the Chinese, because they're very good at hacking, just 
click that mouse, and they take all that information, and, and within a very short period of time, probably shorter than it takes us to produce it, will show up with that same fighter aircraft that they've spent no money to get. Um, the third kind of cyber attacks are just people who, who are just lone wolves who just want to sort of destroy something. I mean, the WikiLeaks guys. I think the biggest threat comes from the Chinese hacking. And what, why are they doing what they're doing? I understand why they're doing industrial espionage, because it saves them money. They get their access to technology that they don't, can't and develop themselves. But I worry about what are they doing with all the information they're collecting? Um, they're collecting, I mean, I'm sure that in the state of Wisconsin, you guys have probably been hacked so many times, you have no idea. And they've been hacking things like, you know, the water supply in Oconomowoc, Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up in Madison. <laughs> but, but, but we're not sure what they're doing with it. But the Chinese um, have a whole, they have tens of thousands of individuals, and there's one little city in China, and they are hacking into everything. I mean, they're hacking into the Pentagon, they're hacking into the stuff you'd expect them to do, which is the military industrial base, but they're also hacking into stuff you wouldn't expect them to hack into, which is you know, the streetlight system in certain towns. They're hacking into the electric grid. They're hacking into water supplies and when it turns on, when it turns off. And since the United States is the most dependent country on the planet on high technology, you know, everything you do either goes on the internet or email. You know, we, we just can't live without it. I mean, even traffic lights in a lot of cities are done by systems that go, that go over the internet. So all that stuff is being collected by the Chinese. We're not collecting, by the way, on them. They are collecting on us, and nobody knows what it's for. And so I would say the one place I would really increase defense spending in our efforts is on um, intelligence um, and, and defense against cyber attacks, because, you know, just look what happened to that 30-minute blackout um, at, the, at, the, at the Super Bowl. You know, people thought, oh, was that the Chinese? You know, was that, was that, <laughs> was it Beyonce? Was it the Chinese? But the fact that we had to ask that question, I think, was really frightening. So, um, and, you know, the thing about Reagan that, and Republicans throw this around. I mean, I loved watching all those debates where every Republican came up, I believe in peace through strength. I believe in peace through strength. None of them knew what they were talking about. What peace through strength meant was that you got the toughest, strongest military, nobody picks a fight with you. And that's why Reagan was, a, one of the reasons Reagan was able to win the Cold War, because we, there was a Reagan defense buildup, we built a strong enough military that was stronger than everybody else's, and then we helped bankrupt the Soviet Union by driving down the price of oil, which they depended on. And then Reagan could then look at the world and say, nobody's going to pick a fight with us, and then use that economic leverage to achieve a political and military gain. And that's why I think it's very important to understand that the whole concept of peace through strength is a strong military, not so you can go use it, but you, you develop it so you don't have to use it. And that's how you really win without firing a shot. Oh, sorry. I can't see you very well. Sorry. Okay. I'm Emily Riley from Furman University. And my question for you is, what are your thoughts on women in combat? You know, I had a debate two weeks ago with um, the former vice chief of staff of the Army, General King, who also works for Fox News. And I could see the veins sort of bulging on his head because he said, women should not belong in combat. Women aren't strong enough. They don't have the upper body strength. And my answer to that, having consulted with my daughter, um, among other things, is that, the that I think women do belong in combat, in combat roles, first for three reasons. One, they're already there. You know, the battlefield of today is not the battlefield of World War II. It's not trench warfare of World War I and Downton Abbey. Um, it's, this is a battlefield where there, there are conflicts and, and combat fatalities and casualties everywhere. You know, I, when I was in Afghanistan, I was at David Petraeus's headquarters in Kabul, and we were under attack. And that's supposed to be the safest place there was in Afghanistan. So every place is a, is a battlefield. So women are already in combat. We should just acknowledge that fact and let them um, have the jobs that, that go along with it anyway. The second reason is, this is one of the ways I think that women have not been able to join the highest ranks of the United States military, is it because you need to have a, like a checkbox. Oh, been in combat, uh, been in the infantry. And because women have been held away from those jobs, 
either um, because they haven't had those roles assigned to them, even though they may have been in combat, they don't get promoted to the level that they should be getting promoted to. So that's why we should be seeing a woman four-star general on the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and we're not, and we're not going to see it anytime soon. So I think that women need to have those roles so that they can advance. And then the third reason is, yeah, okay, guys are stronger, right? They have more upper body strength. But today's military, it's not about how much you bench press. It's not about how strong you are. In some cases, maybe. But it's mostly how good you are at using technology, because that's today's all-volunteer force is a very high-tech force. So my, my, when I debated this with General Keene, I said, you know, look, women um, actually do better on the intelligence tests, and they're better shots. So maybe we should just not have any men in intelligence, because women have such a high IQ. Um, he didn't like that. Uh, <laughs> but I do think that whatever we do in allowing women in combat, it doesn't mean that you dumb down the requirements. It doesn't mean that you say, okay, girls, you don't have to have those level of expertise or physical fitness. If a girl can do it, why keep her out of it? If she can't do it, fine. I mean, and I think the most telling thing was when I asked my daughter, I said, honey, you know, this was not this time, but when she was a freshman at the Naval Academy, and I said, so, you know, when you're doing these five-mile runs every morning, do they, like, do you guys get to, the girls get to just sort of stop? And she looked at me and rolled her eyes, and she said, mom, do you really think that, like, three miles into it, they say, girls, you can all take a break now. Boys, keep running. She said, no, they really do have, they already have a lot of the same physical requirements. So I think that women belong in combat. Maybe not every place, but if women can make that test, man, you let them in there. Go ahead. I think you make some great. Oh, by the way, I loved what you said. Yeah. You. Really loved your Reagan quote and everything. Thank you so much for reading that. So I totally agree with you with cyber and having worked in that realm. Um, so I had a two-part question, but. To add on to what you say, and I'm wondering if you would agree, a lot about being in combat and having support of the military, and my husband's in the military, and I've been to the war zones, is decision-making skills. Is decision-making so skills? So we yeah. were talking about, I have friends who are former SEALs, and you look at them in special ops, and, and they're lean, yes, physically fit, but their minds are amazing. And you need people who can think well under pressure. Mm -hmm. And also you look at stability ops, which will be the war of the future. Mm -hmm. Women understand communities and reaching out to people. Mm -hmm. And so I would say, would you agree that it's good to have women in those roles because they think differently than men. And it's good to have that diversity of thought on how we approach some of these problems we're facing. Yeah, I've, I've thought, you know, I've thought long and hard about how do we make so many mistakes in the last 10 years in Afghanistan and Iraq. And I think one of the reasons was that there was no woman in the room. I know that sounds so sexist to say, you know, we think different, but we sometimes women will come and have a different approach to it. I mean, I believe in diversity in decision making. If I'm making a decision, I want to have everybody tell me all the reasons why that might not be a very good idea. And I think that women often will bring a different sort of mindset to it. You know, a woman is not, especially in dealing in the Middle East, where there's so, or even with China, but in the Middle East particularly, where they're not necessarily going to think like you do. I mean, we think, oh gosh, they must want to have education, right? Um, or they must, or, or the Palestinians. This is the thing that always, when Alan and I went to the West Bank um, about two years ago, I was struck by these places um, where you go in Israel, it's, everything's thriving, it looks like Miami Beach, Everybody's got great farms. And then you go over to the, the line into the Palestinian territories on the West Bank, and it's all sort of, you know, nobody's working really hard. It doesn't seem to be working economically. And I said, when we got to some of the, ter ter the settlements, I said, well, you know, why, if an Israeli wants to come and buy that farm or your olive grove and is willing to pay you a lot of money for it, wouldn't you sell it to them? And then it would solve all the problems in the Middle East. And, and the people, the Palestinians said, oh, well, we would never sell it to a Jew. You know, we would never sell it to an Israeli. And I said, why not? You sell it to the highest bidder. You know, make a profit, go live well, go have another house, go get a job. And they just don't think the same way that we do about that. And so I think that having a woman in the room in these decision-making circles, like a woman on the Joint Chiefs of Staff, would be a very healthy thing. Because if you can't answer her question, then maybe you ought to think twice about it. And... Um, so I would agree with you. And maybe you and I can go to Beach and okay. <laughs> and watch both of the veins bulge. <laughs> your next question? 
to the China part, yeah. oh, wow. uh, is from a foreign policy, you see they are, yes, hacking our systems, they're hacking our industrial base, and yet you look at our foreign policy, so part of this is diplomacy, and mm -hmm. they're collecting all that data because they can win a war against us without firing a shot, Yeah, right? They get what it. What would you recommend as far as a balance on what we're doing with, not only in the cyber arena, but we have issues with policy, rules of engagement, what are gonna be our authorities? What do you think we should do diplomatically with regards to China to try to hold them in check and call them on what they're doing? I think a couple of things, and, and, it's, a, and it's a subtle thing, but um, the first thing is, you know, Hillary Clinton said it best. She said, you don't pick a fight with your banker. And as long as we have an economy which requires us to borrow 40 cents of every dollar, and 20 cents of that, you know, half of that 40 cents is borrowed from, particularly from China, then I think we're in a tough position. And I think the Chinese can push and ping us in places like the Sekaku Islands where the Chinese and the Japanese are both claiming sovereignty over these little piles of rock, not because they care about the piles of rock, but because they care about the oil that's in the water around the piles of rock. I think that until we get on a firmer economic footing, it's very difficult to confront them. But I do think that you shouldn't turn blind, you shouldn't let them, um, you should challenge them at every point. You know, it's like a good conservative. You think, oh God, they're saying that, we're just not, that nobody believes that. I mean, if I look at the Romney campaign, it's a perfect example, right? I mean, they said terrible things about him and they never answered it. And they should have answered it. Okay, well, the Chinese are doing the same thing. They're sort of pinging us here. They're, they're pinging us on um, our relationship with Japan. They're pinging us on our relationship with the Philippines. And we're kind of looking the other way. I think we should just stand up to it every single time because it's a country that doesn't respect us when we try to be Mr. Nice Guy. And so I would certainly do that. Um, and then I think, though, that then the longer run, you know, when you saw the media, medium long, I think China is just a, is just a time bomb. Not good. You know, we, we all saw the pictures of Pe Beijing last week where people are wearing masks, they're putting tents in their backyards to, because of the air pollution is so bad, the health ramifications of that. China's one child policy that they instituted about 25 years ago, where every family is only allowed to have one child, and because they prefer male children, um, they would you know, deal with it, they, they, and they have no issues about abortion or birth control or any of that stuff, so that there were a lot of aborted births, so that the population now is for every 100 female, you know, female babies, there's probably 125, 130 male babies. And so what happens to a society which 10, 15 years from now, a quarter of the population doesn't get a bride, you know, doesn't get a wife. It's a population and a, and a culture which doesn't believe in immigration. It's not like the Chinese are going to do what the California 49ers did when they didn't have wives. They got them from Russia. They got them from here. They got them from there. The Chinese are not going to do that. They're a very racist society. They are not going to be happy with Japanese or Korean wives. So you've got a population which is going to have a predominantly male element to it. They're not going to have brides. Um, they're a conservative society, so the other alternatives to that probably aren't going to work for them. They're going to get to a certain level of economic achievement, and the goal has always been for the last 25 years, your life's going to get better, you're going to get a bigger house, you're going to get what, 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 and when that's going to sort of level off. And so I see that China um, is going to be like Japan was, that we thought they were going to take over the world, and I don't think they are. But I also think that as they get to that point, they're going to be nasty. Hey. If I could just uh, maybe be the last one, and I'm getting the evil eye from the timekeepers here, but if I could just take you back to women in combat, just for a quickie here. Yeah. A lot of conservative women, mothers, wives, the image of the 18-year-old boys and girls sharing the pup tents out in the field. I know you say we're, we're not mm -hmm. doing land wars, wars anymore. And the, the, we heard about Emily's in ROTC at Furman, and they had a 30-day co-ed camp, is that what it was, in the summer, and they shared toilets, and they shared showers, and it was so truly disgusting, according to her uh, description of it, and it was combat practice, carrying the big packs and running and all that. Would you talk a little bit about that side of it, yeah. as opposed to, you know, that we know the women are smart, we know they need to be there for decision making, but the day, the day living, and this image of all snuggling up together in the pup tents, <laughs> and uh, I mean, well, I mean, you know, you could <laughs> gaze in the military. Haven't we just dealt with that? Um, yeah, that's not going to be easy. 
But on the other hand, you know, the United States military, when it desegregated in the late 40s, everybody said, well, you know, you can't have whites and blacks together. Um, when gays in the military, which maybe some people don't agree with, but we now have full rights, they're going to say, well, how, you know, what if you turn, turns out that your buddy in the foxhole's gay? Is he going to be, like, making a pass at you if you're a guy? Um, so I think that those are all problems. We shouldn't pretend they're not going to be there. But I think we should confront them head on and have training, sensitivity training. You know, maybe the solution is going to be you have an all-female unit. Or maybe the solution is that you have women in a different part of, of um, infantry position. Let's just figure it out. You know, this is not going to be the fact that women and men can't share a bathroom or have to go to the bathroom in the field. Is, ooh, isn't that going to be icky? I think, you know, I think we could just solve that. I mean, I know that when I went to see my son's college dorm and there was you know girls and guys shared the, the bath I was horrified and I thought oh god how could you shower in that bath you know the guys are such pigs you can't shower in the same shower um, because they never clean up after themselves I think those are issues and we shouldn't pretend they're not I think sexual harassment will be an issue uh, I th we shouldn't pretend it's not but I don't think it then should be a reason that we don't put women in those positions okay thank you very much